given a name to my pain. Hey now, welcome to episode number 56 of the Batman on Film Social Hour. I am the founder of Batman on Film, Bill Jet Ramey. And on today's show, I am joined by senior BF contributor Ryan Lauer and, and a very, 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 very special guest, the great Michael E. Uslan. We'll discuss his new book, Batman's Batman, Hollywood, The Land of Bilk and Money, his previous book, the Boy Who Loved Batman, which is now becoming a Broadway play and maybe even a big screen movie. And a little bit on the new live action, just a little bit, a little bit on this new, I think, did you hear about it, this new live action Batman film that came out last week? Uh, didn't get a lot of attention. It's called The Batman. So, without further ado, welcome Michael in, and here we go. All right, we have a very special guest today. He is the originator and executive producer of the Batman movie franchise. He was the first instructor to teach an accredited course on comic book folklore and history at any university ever in the world. He's also the author of The Boy Who Loved Batman. He is also one of my Batman heroes, and I'm still in awe that I've had a chance to talk with him for over a decade now. And that would be Mr. Michael Uslan. How are you, sir? You did. Bill, I am terrific. <laughs> Good. <laughs> you, caught, you caught me on one of the truly greatest weeks of my 45-year career. Um, this has been a magical, magical week from our premiere at Lincoln Center of the Batman to the opening reviews, to the opening box office, to the fact that my new memoir, Batman's Batman, was published this week. The audiobook version was published this week, and our Broadway play took a big leap forward. Awesome. Um, it, it, it was just a magical week. Do you want to get right into this, or do you want to just talk briefly about the Batman so we can get that out of the way? Either, either it's up to you. Your call, or we could start with my life story beginning when I was six weeks old, and uh, yes, go on from there. Well, just um, okay. Let me let's talk about the book first, and we save the Batman till the last. So, you know, I've read The Boy Who Loved Batman many times, and uh, I always thought, I wonder if he, he will write something else. And then you told me a while back, I have another book coming. So, and after reading through it and reading it, is it? Is it a companion piece to the boy who loved Batman or, or is it a, or would you call it a straight up sequel? How would you describe it? Well, it's really both. Uh, in movie terms, it's a sequel. Okay. Uh, in book terms, it's a companion piece. Um, the boy who loved Batman was the story of what it took to bring Batman to, to a dark and serious version of Batman to the silver screen and um, what it's like to grow up in the fifties and sixties and even into the early seventies as a comic book geek, when the world was a very, very different place, when reading comic books and collecting comic books was very uncool. Uh, it, if you were over the age of 12, it was very subversive. Uh, it, it, was, it was a completely different world. And um, that's all changed. I kind of miss the subversiveness of it, uh, actually. <laughs> uh, but, but I will either take the blame or the credit for yeah. having uh, made it so mainstream. Um, and that, that was that story. This story was more inspired by a book I read when I was in high school by William Goldman called Adventures in the Screen Trade. And it was about his adventures and misadventures in Hollywood in this crazy industry with all these crazy people. And that was the book that inspired me to pursue this path of movies and animation and television. And I, I wanted it to be a book about 
what it takes to be a producer in Hollywood today, what you, the anguish that you have to go through, the perseverance that you need, all the qualities in life you hopefully will learn as a kid and as you start to grow up, how they apply in the real world in your adult life. I've had more misses than I've had successes in Hollywood. I've had projects I worked on for 10 years that wilted on the vine at the last minute. And this talks about the whole process of what that's like and the challenges it poses. And hopefully will inspire a lot of people um, that if you dream big and if you're willing to make a commitment and persevere, and <clears throat> as I've been saying since day one, knock on doors till your knuckles bleed, um, you can make your dreams come true. But you better have a high threshold for frustration in the process. I like the story about how the book got its name or where the name comes from. If you, yeah. if you want to share that yeah. with the audience. So let me take you all back to <laughs> circa 1979 till, through about 83. Um, my partner on Batman was Benjamin Melnicker. Ben was my dad's age. He was like a second father to me. Ben was a legend in the movie business. He started working in late 1939 at MGM. Not a bad year for MGM mm -hmm. and not a bad year for the movie industry generally. Ben uh, began as general counsel at MGM in its Tiffany years, uh, headed up its antitrust division, and he personally negotiated the Paramount Consent Decree of 1948 with the Attorney General of the United States, whereby the studios had to divest themselves of their movie theaters. Ben went on to become the sole executive vice president at MGM. All divisions reported to Ben. He was chairman of their film selection committee, and he put together the deals for movies like Dr. Zhivago, Ben-Hur, 2001 A Space Odyssey, Gigi and their musicals. That's the background. We now are in our final major studio pitch meeting on Batman. And we've been turned down by everyone to this point. Everyone was telling me I was crazy. It was the worst idea they ever heard. You can't do dark superheroes. You can't do serious comic book movies. And I'm pitching to this silver haired guy who Ben knew for decades. And I finished the pitch. And this was the guy who told me that Batman would never succeed as a movie because the movie Annie wasn't doing well. And... I, I, and it's the infamous story. I said, are you talking about that little redheaded girl from Broadway who sings the song Tomorrow? And he said, yeah. And I go, well, what does that have to do with Batman? And he shook his head and said, oh, come on, Michael. They're both out of the funny pages. Frederick Wortham could have said that right then and there. And he said, look, Ben, he said, you and I go back a long way. If you boys really want to make a Batman movie, I'll consider doing that with you, but it must be the funny, pot-bellied, pow-zap wham Batman from TV that audiences will remember and love. And I looked at him and said, no way. And he got in front of me and leaned in and said, son, better to have a movie made than no movie at all. And I looked at him and I said, no. And that was it. That was our last major studio now turned down everywhere. We were sitting on a bench on the park-like atmosphere in this studio, and I was despondent. I was absolutely despondent. And Ben turned to me and he said, you know, Michael, I think it's pretty ironic that the last no we received came from you. He said, you know what that makes you? I said, yeah, Ben, an idiot. He says, no, no. He said, it makes you Batman's Batman. I said, what are you talking about? He said, you just sacrificed a whole hell of a lot of money. You just sacrificed an opportunity to make a movie because it's more important to you to defend and protect Batman. And this, this vision you have for this movie based on the way he was created, he said, you're his protector, you're his defender, you are Batman's Batman. And he said, now, Let's get over it. And there's other places we can go. There's non-traditional places. There's foreign companies. And let's just redouble our efforts. 
And Ben picked me right up out of the doldrums, out of my little mini state of depression. And as I say in the book, off we went into movie history. True. I think, yes. I, th I think the, the uh, seeds of that story are also sprinkled throughout the book because I found the book is serving as inspirational. And your even final chapter was called The Priorities in which you said family, friends, then work. So in this position, you're not, un you're very uncertain of the future, but you stuck to your guns of, no, absolutely not. That's not what I imagined. Not knowing what the future was. And I think I like with this book that you've almost, it's almost like you face those kind of decisions throughout your life and you stuck to your guns and you, you know, you say in the book of, you know, a, a lot more misses than hits, but look at, you don't know what's coming and it could be, good things are coming. So I think it's appreciative, the message of the book of stick to your guns, believe in yourself, and you don't know what's coming. It could be some, some good things. It's absolutely true. But let me tell you something, you better have a good support system. Um, mm -hmm. My family was behind me 100%, from my wife to my parents to um, my brother, um, and then my cousins. I mean, everybody was supportive, as were my friends. And I mean, 10 years, from that moment, it took 10 years to get Batman on the screen uh, in a dark and serious way. And as you read in The Boy Who Loved Batman, there were plenty of times I ran out of money. I didn't know how I was going to pay my bills the following week. And boy, if you don't have a supportive wife and family uh, mm -hmm. under pressure like that and stress like that, you're toast. You're just toast. So I, I lucked out. <laughs> the second, the, I guess the subtitle is... A memoir from Hollywood, Land of Bilk and Money, which is, is both funny and kind of poignant and has a strong message at the same time. So what was the what was your purpose of including that subtitle in the book? Hollywood is often portrayed as a land of broken dreams and broken promises and screamers and egotists, or is it egoists, um, crazy people, um, people who have never heard the word no in their lifetime. Um, and I've encountered all of it. I've encountered all of it. But I've also encountered wonderful people, creative people, interesting people, grounded people, people that have values people that have priorities and that I've learned in life, Bill, that life is made up of choices. It's made up of what you choose to do and what you choose not to do, what you choose to say and what you choose not to say. And every one of those choices has consequences. In Hollywood, there are paths you can walk down. I've seen people being seduced by the party scene here where they lose their grounding. They get caught up in who they know and trying to be seen or trying to see and, and they lose themselves and they lose all their original goals and ambitions in the process. So that whole thing is the part of Hollywood that to me is the land of bilk and money. Um, but then I've seen this other side, which is the creative land of milk and honey. And you've got to navigate it. And a lot of times you're working with companies that today are international conglomerates. It's not like they're just a, a, a studio and you deal with corporate intrigue and the machinations of big corporations. And you have to navigate your way through that as well. There's two types of production executives I've encountered more recently than when I first started out. There are those who are in positions of some degree of authority who are not very literate. They, they are supposed to be production executives, but their credentials are based on the fact that they see tons of movies and watch every streaming or TV show. Then, there, and, and some of them got their positions because as I say, they are some important person's wife's dentist's son. <laughs> but then you find these production executives who are literate, who are well-read, um, who know the classics, who know mythology, who understand structure and, uh, and the craft of writing 
and and have a have a sense of what's commercial and what's marketable and are global in their perspectives and not just limited to the notion of what's going to work for North American boys who play video games. And that's wonderful. And you learn who's who. So now when I go to pitch at different places, I have my choice people that I specifically will go to and other people I will specifically ignore. And that's one of the ways that I've managed to navigate between the land of milk and money and the land of milk and honey. Very good. I, I got to say one of the uh, favorite parts of seeing in the book was the chapter on the pitch, because I think your energy and enthusiasm bleeds through the, the book and how it feels as if you were deprived, you'd, you'd really prepared for your pitch. And there were times you were kind of deprived of getting to give the full pitch and you felt, no, I'm here to give my pitch. I've been preparing. I'm ready to perform. Let me get through this. And I, I really like that. Just a side note. I really like that throughout the um, too. That's the monopoly story in particular. <laughs> oh my yeah. God. The biggest frustration of my life came because they said, yes, we're going to make this movie with you too quickly. <laughs> <laughs> And I didn't have a chance to, to do this pitch that I worked on so hard for six months. I, I really felt cheated. And Ben was telling me, shut up. <laughs> Let's go get this deal. You'll tell them later. Uh, yeah, but that's, that's absolutely true. Chapter 12, which yeah. was amusing. I just wanted to know what your, it, it's, it was amusing the way you, you wrote it and with, with the, yeah. Blank page. So I'll just talk about that because it was, uh, I got a chuckle and it was very interesting at the same time. Look, it, it, it is public knowledge over the century that um, a lot of movies and television series that one might think were quite successful um, wound up not paying off on the back end or, or what's called profits. And um, there's been so much written about it. I didn't feel I needed to write anything about it, which is w w the main reason I left the page blank. Um, but it happens. There was that um, famous case where um, Kelsey Grammer uh, sued the network over Frasier uh, because they were claiming there were no profits. Um, and, and, and there have been many others. Um, the famous case was uh, the Eddie Murphy case, uh, the Coming to America case, I believe it was. Um, so, yeah, you know, so what, what can you say? My, my position is simply this. If you have people, creative people, money people, whoever it was that pitched in to make a project successful, then let's all be straight with each other and let's all share in it. And, um, and I, and I think that's really important. And I think that goes vis-a-vis -vis the, uh, uh, the people who own the intellectual properties as well. It, it goes to the people who spent the better part of their lifetimes crafting a gift to the world. And those people need to be compensated well in addition. So it, it, it's just a statement of that. And it ties into the whole concept of gigantic corporations and how business is done. Because at the end of the day, Bill, we have to remember that this whole thing is called show business. And that means it's 50% show and 50% business. And if you only know and only concentrate on the creative side of it, um, you are apt uh, prey to the lurking predators out there. Uh, and, and there are people who will attempt to take your ideas and take your work. There are people that will attempt to, uh, to cheat you. Um, but there's also the great people and great companies. And again, it keeps coming back to that same concept, navigating between milk and money and milk and honey. You, it, it's reminded me when you talked about just now bringing up the, uh, the creators and so forth and sharing with them, just to inject a little Batman or the Batman in here. Um, of course, we get uh, Batman created by... Bob Kane with Bill Finger. And I know that was a huge um, part of a, a campaign that you were very much part of with Mr. Finger. But at the end, you know, uh, Matt Reeves in the production pays credit to a lot of the folks who they took inspiration from in the comics. And I don't know if I've seen that in a, in a Batman film yet where 
they specifically mention well specific specific people and if you're a batman fan you know what they're talking what what uh comic book inspirations and whatnot they're referring to yeah i would go so far as to in my own humble opinion um to say that matt more than uh any other filmmaker specifically derived inspiration from specific batman stories pieces of this pieces of that um and and he's a fan and i think that um because there are so many specific sources of inspiration for this i, I think it was a terrific thing uh, for him to want to credit uh, all of those people. And they deserve it. They absolutely deserve it. To, to kind of go in line with that, as you can you tell us what it was like, a uh, lifelong comic book reader, to have to narrow it down to 13 quotes from Batman comics or Bat-related comics for <laughs> each chapter? I'd feel like that would be equal parts exciting, equal parts stressful. <laughs> that's, that's a great way to put it. That is really yeah. a great way to put it. Um, yeah, I, I knew the points I was trying to make, mm -hmm. uh, with each chapter and overall, and, you know, I'm enough of a geek that I knew where to go for, uh, most of those credits, uh, to find what I wanted to find, what stories put the accent on the things that I was trying to stress in this particular chapter. Um, but yeah, there was a long list that I then had to whittle down. The last time I had a challenge like that, I was putting together a book for Simon & Schuster called America at War, the Best of DC War Comics. And in my initial um, compilation, I had 356 pages in a book that, you know, was only going to be like 150 pages long, whatever it was. That was one of the hardest chores I ever had to do in my comic book life. Um, wow. This, this ranks second to that. Oh, boy. I imagine so. <laughs> Is there, there's lots of stories in this. Um, is there, I've always asked you about favorites and you always say, well, they're like children. I have so many favorites, but is there, was there any story that you included in the book that is a, maybe a favorite of yours or something that um, you'd want to share right now? So people know, okay, this is in here and there's lots of other cool stories as well. Because I like most, I like all of them. Because I like, well, you know, there's there's favorite stories from each different phase of my life is the best way I could put it. Okay. Um, there's um, Wes Craven's Chain Vomit. Um, <laughs> <laughs> oh um, boy. Yeah. Um, there was the time I met Dean Martin, and wound up <laughs> on Muzak. They were playing Everybody Loves Somebody Sometime. I'm in Mateo's, which was the old Rat Pack restaurant that was their main restaurant uh in los angeles and it's 1992 we're there dean martin comes in it's late at night um he's there alone and the, everybody loves somebody sometimes comes on and i'm walking by the table and he looks at me and smiles i look at him and smile and i just said dean you gotta sing this to me <laughs> and he looked at me and he goes son i already sang that song you sing it to me. Now, I can't carry a tune, but let me tell you something. At the top of my lungs, I belted it out, everybody loves somebody sometime to Dean Martin in the middle of, the, of this restaurant. And he was hysterical. Um, but if you don't seize those moments when they happen, what, what the hell did you get into this industry for anyway? It's moments like that, that that are reminders to me of what I'm doing here and, and what inspired me to get into this crazy business. Um, so I, I really, I really kind of love that story. Um, in terms of the pitches, um, the most challenging pitch I ever had, which I would say was the most satisfying pitch, was Where in the World is Carmen San Diego as a live action movie. I describe it in the book that it's the pitch that went on for two hours. And the production executive was the smartest, um, most well-prepared production exec I had ever pitched to. And he was questioning me on everything, plot points, subplot points, character arcs, setups, payoffs, tone. And I had an answer for everything. And we were going toe to toe. I think at the end of it, we had both soaked through our shirts 
I felt like it was <laughs> Muhammad Ali versus Joe Frazier. And I walked out of there and Ben said, my God, that was amazing. I said, Ben, that was the greatest, that was the greatest pitch experience I ever had. Uh, and, and I think it really was. Um, another great one was um, the Constantine pitch. When I'm at Warner Brothers with Kevin Broadman, we'd been working together for six months to do a beat by beat three act pitch of the movie. And we get done and the production exec says, oh my God, I, I love this. And uh, I, I said, I told you, it's the James Dean of the occult world. He said, Michael, if you had your choice to work with anybody on the Warner Brothers lot, who would you want to work with on this? I said, no question, Dick Donner. I mean, the man did the omen. I would love to be working with Dick. He picks up a phone. He said, <clears throat> calls Dick and Lauren and says, you got to hear this. How soon can you be here? 15 minutes later, Dick and Lauren are in the office. And he says, do the whole thing all over again. <laughs> and we do it all over again. And, and they were excited. They said, we're in which was great uh, having Lauren Schuler Donner as a producing partner. She's incredible. Um, and as we're walking out, the production executive at Warner Brothers puts an arm around Kevin Broadman and says, this is going to be great, Kevin. We'll get you started. I know you're going to do a great screenplay on this. He goes, you look familiar to me. Have we worked together before on some picture? And Kevin looked at him, he says, well, actually, one year ago today, I was your temp for two weeks. <laughs> and that to me was one of the great Hollywood stories. Yeah. Guys, temp to his premier screenwriter. It was just a great moment. If, okay, I got to ask you this. I, to me, I read it and it's like, I get, I, I'll, it's like um, a very informational story, but it's also like your TED talk is kind of woven in here as well. But if so, what if somebody is an aspiring producer, what would you what would you say to them about this book? And like, if someone was teaching a class on producing film, and I'm, I'm assuming that if you go to film school, there is classes on producing film. It, it's this, this would be like must read, wouldn't it? It's, it's, it's so informative. Two, two ways to approach this. Number one, on that point specifically, you can pick up a textbook about producing or directing, um, but you can't get experiential learning. You, you can't, uh, unless you're reading about things that take place in the trenches every day in Hollywood, mm -hmm. in an industry that is rapidly changing at a revolutionary pace, um, I'm finding a lot of my students um, and because I go back every year and I teach two intensive courses at Indiana University Media School for three weeks. And what the feedback I get from all my students is we could never get this out of a book. We could never get this out of a lecture. Um, you, you've got to bring experiential learning to people. And mm -hmm. that's one of the primary purposes on the producing side of this book. But you're right about that regarding like the TED Talk. This book is actually for anybody in any field who wants to do anything because it's the same basic rules that apply. Be prepared, um, do your homework. Um, there's two types of people in the world. Those who come out of school and say, okay, what's the least I can do and get away with it? And then there are those people who say, okay, what's the most I can do and then ask for more. And about how you get recognized being the latter people. How you get through an interview with an old fart like me? I mean, how do you do that? Mm -hmm. um, what does it take? Um, you know, so many basic things. Better to be an hour early than five minutes late. So many of these can just apply to whatever you choose to do in life. And um, that that's part of the feedback that I've been getting, which is very gratifying. I That's how I took it, because I'm not going to be a producer but i found the the the, the stories is super interesting just the history of it because i'm a history buff and but I, I would recommend it i mean it applies to whatever profession you want to do because that that sticking to your guns and and keep getting off the floor if you're knocked down it, that applies to anything just anything it really does and one of the things that i find and this is a generalization but i'm going to make it anyway is that um, 
as I've gone around North America in particular, but also other countries, I found that the vast majority of young people of the past two generations, and maybe COVID has something to do with it, I don't know. They tend to want to sit back on their couch in a misguided sense of entitlement and wait for the world to come to them or thinking that that's going to happen, mm -hmm. uh, that the world owes them something. And the 15% or so that actually get up off the couch and are proactive to explore their passions and, and pursue their passions and um, take positive action about it. If you're one of the 15% that does that, then your competition is now 15%, not 100%. So your chance of success just skyrocketing. And that's one of the points I always try to make as well. Um, you can do it. Look, you're talking to a blue collar kid who did not come from money, um, who knew nobody in Hollywood, who had no relatives in Hollywood. And I jumped the Grand Canyon. I jumped the Grand Canyon. I made my dreams come true. Um, and, and that's in its essence, what appealed to the folks at the Nederlander organization as to why they chose the boy who loved Batman as now supplemented by Batman's Batman as their choice to turn into a Broadway play. Thank you for bringing that up because I was going to ask how how is Dark Nights and Daydreams coming along? And you just said there you got some good news this month, so it's been a great week, great month so far. So. It has been. Um, everybody is um, is wonderful to work with there. Everybody's wonderful, and for me, look, Bill, I'm in the fourth quarter of my career, right? Yeah. But I still got the ball, and I'm still looking for the goal line. And now I'm forced out of my comfort zone at this ripe old age and, and I'm doing something. Broadway is completely different than movies and television and comic books and graphic novels and animation. And I'm learning new things, um, and, but I'm working with people who are experts in the field, who really, really know it well, whom I can rely on. And that's very exciting for me. Uh, it, creatively, it's a wellspring. And I have to learn how to deal with the fact that... Um, there are going to be people involved who are going to be telling my story in addition, you know, to, to mm -hmm. me and learning how to, how to deal with that and meeting people who really understand me and really understand my books. Um, that's, that's been terrific. Um, so we are being fast tracked right now and it is a, it's a, it's a wonderful ride. Well, it, it also become a film. Uh, yes, is okay. the answer. Um, once the Broadway show is up and running, we will be talking about the feature film version. Look, during COVID, when COVID first started, I sat down with my kids and I said, listen, the whole industry is in a mass panic. Everybody's sitting there going, this is a catastrophe, a catastrophe. I said, we cannot look at it that way. We have to look at this as an opportunity. I said, kids, this could go on for six months. I had no idea it would be almost two years. I said, we need to take advantage of this time. We need to understand that normal is not returning to society. It's not going to return to this industry. There's going to be a new normal. And nobody knows what that's going to be. Mm -hmm. But we need to plan for it. And everybody needs to get busy. So during COVID, I wrote Batman's Batman. I wrote the play. And then I wrote the feature film screenplay based on The Boy Who Loved Batman. And um, uh, I will, well, I sh I'm supposed to save this, I'm not, but let me just say that okay. um, we have signed my first and only choice of director uh, for the feature film. And um, there'll be an announcement coming later this year about it. It's very exciting. And w when you hear the, the movies that he's done and the television he's done, you realize he's exactly the right choice for this project. We have, uh, our budget is done, you know, everything's lined up. Um, I even know the guy who's the chairman of the New Jersey Film Commission, uh, which is me. And we, uh, <laughs> uh, we hope to film most of it in, uh, in New Jersey. So it's very exciting. Awesome. Uh, Ryan, I, oh, go ahead. I, I was just gonna say, sorry, uh, I guess an even greater tease for that is you even mentioned in the book as, it can only be described as a Christmas story for anyone who grew up loving comic books. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I mean, I was in, but then seeing that, uh, I'm even more in, I don't know how you can get even more in for something, <laughs> but I, that's a great, to me, that's just a great tease for, for that movie. If 
that's what you pull as relating it to. It's very exciting. Think back. Um, can I assume, I guess I shouldn't in this day and age assume this. Can I assume you guys started reading comics when you were little kids? Yes, sir. Or, yes. Okay. Yeah. So if you could think back to those years and what I always describe as the sense of wonder that comic books gave you as a kid, um, my goal in this movie is to capture that sense of wonder. And um, if you capture the sense of wonder, you'll capture the childhood and you'll capture the essence of what I found with the book, The Boy Who Loved Batman, which was fans and just readers who, who aren't even hardcore comic book fans telling me it was like I was reading my own story. I'm the boy who loved Batman or I'm the girl who loved Batman. I relate to that, yes. Mm -hmm. and, and it is about capturing that. So through me as your vehicle, I want everybody to feel when they see the play or the movie that they're, they're just projecting themselves right onto the screen. I relate right. to that <laughs> completely. Um, so I got to ask you, the Batman. You've done, starting with Batman 89, and I'm not going to ask you to, I always, I've asked you, I've learned not to ask you to, to rank it. And I'm, I would never do that because <laughs> they're like his children, he says. Um, but the response that this film has gotten, and you're just, you seeing it as, as, as just the fan in you seeing it. What was your, what's your emotions and your, your thoughts about it? Everything. The emotion is exhilaration. I went back into some of my old early correspondence that I fished out of a storage facility. And to look back, to refresh my recollection, as of late 1989, I was already campaigning at the studio that we need to show the part of Batman as the world's greatest detective. It only took 33 years. And it was worth the wait. I mean, how else can yeah. I explain to you the impact of what Matt Reeves has done? And let me take a second here. There's other people that deserve a spotlight here. Dylan Clark. Um, this couldn't have happened without Dylan Clark. Walter Hamada, uh, DC Films. Um, Toby Emmerich of Warner Brothers. There, there are people within the studio and DC structure who deserve a spotlight for what's happened here. The same way, you know me, I always say, the folks on the animated side don't get enough attention. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and they're brilliant and, and they need to have that attention. Um, but what, what Matt has done, it, it has been, you know, in a sense to fulfill the mission that I started out with in 1979. And, um, and, and that's incredible. It, it's a Batman many of us have longed to see. It is different than, I, it is not to be, it should not be compared to the Dark Knight trilogy, which is its own wonderful, amazing, brilliant thing by yes. a genius filmmaker. Very it should not be compared to the Tim Burton work, that young genius who but for him and his big idea, none of this would exist. Whether DC or Marvel, mm -hmm. none of it would exist. And let me, let me take a half a second here. Tim, what I always call the big idea. Folks, it was Tim Burton who said, if we're going to do the world's first ever dark and serious comic book movie for people who have never read a comic book in their lives around the world, this movie cannot be about Batman. It must be about Bruce Wayne. That was the big idea. And Marvel fans, come on, let's, let's get real. The, those great and wonderful Iron Man movies should really be entitled Tony Stark. Mm. Those great Spider-Man movies should be entitled Peter Parker. Everybody owns, o, owes a debt to Tim Burton in that vision. And the corollary to his vision was that from the opening frames of 89, Gotham City had to be the third most important character in the piece. It was about the world building. Mm -hmm. And if, if you don't get audiences immediately to believe in Gotham City, they will never suspend their disbelief and, and buy into an actor who gets dressed up as a bat and is fighting a guy like the Joker. 
And he was absolutely right about that. And look at the impact that he and Anton first have had on every single genre picture to this to this weekend mm -hmm. in terms of what they've done. You know, I, I have a, a bit of a sardonic smile. You know, the reviews are like 95% positive and, uh, and are amazing. Um, you know, I see the, uh, some of them that go, oh, this is so dark. Oh, it's dark. It's dreary. It's too dark. It's too dreary. For God's sake, it's Batman. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> and this movie is not for little kids. Well, my answer to that is this movie is not for little kids. Mm -hmm. And there's a reason it's a PG-13 and a hard PG-13 mm -hmm. at that. Yeah. And um, I, I've, I've told generations of parents, look at the ratings. Don't take your five-year-old to a movie that's PG-13. Um, you know, you know your kids better than anybody. And maybe you can say, okay, my kid's only 12, but we'll be able to handle this emotionally. Mm -hmm. And I've done my homework and I understand what's involved in this movie. That's one thing. But, but generally speaking, this, this is, you know, the, the, the cinema antecedents for this movie are not former Batman movies and they're not Marvel movies. They are Silence of the Lambs, Seven, The Usual Suspects, Chinatown, Zodiac. Uh, this is a noir crime drama. And, um, and Batman has deserved this. Yes, so you said that right now. Definitely, it's exhilarating. Do you, by chance, remember during this uh, long road to the Batman, perhaps your first shot of exhilaration that you got, where you started to feel like, "Oh, I think we're we're onto something really special here." Yeah, the '89 movie was completed. Ben and I were about to go into a private screening of the finished movie. In order to go into this theater, there were thick, um, I guess it was thick, like velour curtains um, that you had to pass through. It almost felt rubbery. It was very, very heavy, thick curtains. And just as a, I'm about to walk into the theater, Ben touches me on the shoulder and I turn around. He said, Michael, you're walking through these curtains right now. Two hours from now, you're going to walk out and your life will have changed. And that's exactly what happened. That's exactly what happened. Um, that was a, mo a moment of exhilaration. Um, that summer, I was watching the fall of the Berlin Wall on CNN huh. and couldn't stop watching it. I was transfixed. I was watching it through the night and about 1.30 in the morning live, there are people pouring through the, the chopped wall. And this one kid comes through, he's probably 10 years old, comes through into freedom for the first time in his life and he's wearing a Batman hat. And I said, oh my God, this is so much more than about a box office. Mm. We are having an impact worldwide culturally. Something much bigger is happening now. That was a key moment. Um, the third great moment for the first film was when my phone rang the Monday after our opening weekend. And it was one of the production executives from the studio who had turned me down 10 years before, told me I was out of my mind and that it was the worst idea he ever heard. I pick up the phone, he goes, Michael, just called to congratulate you on the success of Batman. I always said you were a visionary. <laughs> That's great. Um, that was yeah. a good epiphany to have early on. Going back, just talking about the Batman and, you know, don't take your kids, and I get it. What do you say to folks who would say, well, how do, and this is from someone, and we brought this up. I started looking at comic books before I could read. And I would, you know, and that's, and it helped me learn to read as well. And then, I'm talking, you know, three, four, because I have comics that obviously my mom bought me out of a, the old spinning comic book racks, you know, at the convenience store when I was a kid that I, their age, I know I could, I know I had to be two or three years old and I still have lots of them, but, um, and that was my kind, can do it into the world of Batman. And then of course the 60s TV series when I was a child, but, um, 
this the batman yes that's how i want batman to be presented i i'm the dark and serious batman uh when when people say you know you brought up it's too dark uh kids have to have a way to get into the character what 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 what, sh- what would you say to them and what would you recommend because i i say there's a lots there's lots of stuff batman for kids absolutely batman fans so let me take you back now you know my origin you know my secret origin this whole thing began for me the night the batman tv show premiered and i was thrilled and horrified by what i was seeing and when i realized that it was a comedy and they were making a joke out of batman and the world was laughing at batman that's what made me make my vow that someday i will show the world the true batman as he was created by bill and bob and that set me on my journey The reason I was so vehemently opposed to that TV series at that moment in time was that was the one and only interpretation the whole world had of Batman, the people Mm -hmm. that don't read the comic books. And that's what killed me. So it's a completely different story now today. Yes, There are so many different interpretations of Batman out there that you can choose from. There's the ones that I consider to be my true Batman, which we've been presenting in movies and animation. Mm-hmm. Um, but now I embrace the Batman TV show because I see it as a gift to young kids, as a way to indoctrinate them into the world of Batman and Gotham City mm-hmm. and the Joker and, and the Penguin and uh, Riddler. Um, and that's terrific to have that as an outlet. For the same reason, I embrace the animated movie Batman meets Scooby-Doo. Yes. That's a way in for little kids. What about Batman Brave and Bold? I was going to ask you about that. That is uh, such a love letter to Batman, along with that and Lego Batman movie. That yeah. I would say, if someone said to me, I've got a young kid, Bill, how do I get him into Batman? I, Batman Brave and Bold and uh, and uh, uh, a Lego Batman movie would immediately come to mind because of the history that's included. And those uh, in that in that series and in that film, I contend that there are three movies that are written on two levels that little kids can absolutely love and enjoy, but fans could just and adults generally could just crack up and, and understand the level that they're being mm-hmm. uh, entertained at, and that is the Lego Movie, the Lego Batman Movie, where you're not laughing at Batman, you are laughing with Batman. Yes. And a little one that's flown under the radar. And I am a huge fan and tell every fanboy and fangirl I know to go see this movie. Teen Titans go to the movies. Yeah. This yes. film is written on two levels. Mm-hmm. It's hysterical for anyone who's mm-hmm. a fan. And it marks the one and only time Stan Lee did a cameo in a DC comic book movie. Wow. <laughs> yeah. It is your yeah. Go ahead, Brian. I'm sorry. I was going to say, can you uh, to you? So you have that on one end of the spectrum, and then you have the Batman at the other end. And Batman seems to me as one of the one of the only characters that can fit so many different genres. Uh, What is it about that character's core that makes him able to be able to do that? You know what I mean. First of all, the comic books did it. Sure. If you look at the comic books from 1939 to today, you can get um, dark and serious Batman. You Mm -hmm. could get Frank Miller Batman. You can get Neil Adams or Jim Aparo or um, uh, Marshall Rogers Batman. You can also get Bat Genie, Bat Might, Bat Robot, Rainbow Batman, fighting the Polka Dot Man, the Calendar Man, uh, twiddle D and twiddle dumb. So the comics themselves have ranged from one absolute extreme to another absolute extreme. So the, the, the intellectual property itself does that. Why? How does it do it? It's because Batman is human. That's it. So everybody can identify with that. And what I found over the years, whether you're a fan or anybody living in any foreign land, you have the ability to project yourself onto Batman. You can project your own philosophies, your own politics onto it. One of the great ironic moments for me was when Dark Knight came out. Political pundits on 
each side of the coin were claiming the dark night is theirs. You could turn on Fox News and they're saying, <laughs> oh, this is yeah. our guy because he's this and he does that. Then you turn on MSNBC and the far left is going, this is our guy mm -hmm. because he acts this way and does that. It's amazing that you, you have the ability to do that. And it's because of Batman and that he's human and he's also a symbol and, and people just put themselves into him. And, and that's magic. Mm -hmm. It is. So before we let you go back to the book, any final words you want to throw out there to the folks listening about Batman's Batman? Just uh, anything that we might have missed asking or whatnot? Well, one story I, I want to uh, recount, because this is a character that's been near and dear to my heart forever, is The Shadow. Um, I wrote The Shadow for DC Comics back in the mid-1970s. I was privileged to write the first ever team-up of The Shadow and the Avenger for Denny O'Neill at DC. Um, 35 years later, uh, Nikki Barucci at Dynamite Comics said, what will it take to get you back to write The Shadow? We got the rights. And I wound up writing the first meeting ever of The Shadow and the Green Hornet in uh, Dark great, Nights. Great stuff, yeah. Um, I wrote Justice Incorporated, which was in 80 years, the first ever team up of the Condé Nast, Street and Smith, Big Three, mm -hmm. um, The Avenger, Doc Savage, and The Shadow. I knew Walter Gibson, the creator. I worked with Walter. I got to ask him as many annoying questions as I possibly could about the, the history of the character and what his thoughts were and the writing. And every time I write The Shadow, I always picture Walter standing over my shoulder and I have to write to please him. And um, so it's been very important to me. So I got the rights to The Shadow and wanted to make a shadow movie. Um, CAA, Creative Artists Agency, calls me and they said, listen, we have a client, a director, who is the world's largest, biggest shadow fan. And he would love to do the movie. Would you meet with him? I go, who is it? He said, um, Sam Raimi. I said, yeah, I think I can make the time to meet with <laughs> Sam Raimi. So <clears throat> went over to meet Sam with my head of development at the time, F.J. DeSanto. And we come in and um, he goes, Uslin, Uslin. He goes, that's an unusual name. I said, yeah, I know it is. He goes, any relation to a Dr. Paul Uslin, who's an optometrist in Ann Arbor, Michigan? I go, Sam, that's my brother. That's my big brother. Where do you come to Paul? He goes, well, when I was growing up outside of Ann Arbor, my mom used to take us into town to get our eyes checked and get our glasses from Dr. Uslin. Wow. Yeah. So I, I pick up my cell phone and I call my brother. I go, Paul, <clears throat> does the name Sam Raimi ring a bell? He goes, oh, sure. He goes, I took care of the whole family. He goes, whatever happened to that boy? <laughs> <laughs> I said, I'm sitting here with that boy. So we start talking <clears throat> and I said, Sam, your, ver your vision of the shadow. Is it the pulp vision? Is it the radio show? Is it a hybrid? He says, well, actually, Michael, it is more heavily pulp, but it really comes primarily from the comic books I loved so much as a kid um, that DC published. I go, oh my God, really? <clears throat> he said, yeah. He, I said, well, what would you like to see in a shadow movie? So we started talking about some things. I go, wait a minute. I reach into my briefcase and I came well prepared. I pulled out the two issues of the DC shadow that I wrote. I go, Sam, you're talking about this sequence. He goes, yeah, that, and that one. Yeah. I go, I wrote these. He goes, I know that. He goes, <laughs> Michael, he goes, you know, we met once before. And then I was embarrassed. I said, oh my God, Sam, I'm so sorry. I, I, I don't recall our meeting. He goes, 1972 Indianapolis Comic-Con. Do you remember that? I said, yeah, that was the first Comic-Con I was ever invited to as a pro. I was writing The Shadow and Beowulf for DC and was just about to start writing Batman for Detective Comics. He said, when I read in a fanzine that you were gonna be speaking there about The Shadow, I begged my folks, they drove me to Indianapolis. I was in the room, I heard you talk. And afterwards I came up to you and asked you to sign my comic books. He said, you sign my comics, you talk to me for 20 minutes, as if I was the only person in the room, he said, let's do this. Let's do this together. And it was like, wow, what an incredible cosmic moment. And now here comes the other side of the story, guys. 
we had what I could have been the greatest shadow movie set in the late thirties um, where it's supposed to be set. Great first draft screenplay by the brilliant Siavash Farahani. We made the right choice, which was not to go with Shawan Khan as the villain, but to go with Benedict Stark, Mr. Remorse, the Prince of Evil. And then we wound up ultimately getting from the studio, well, this is all great guys, but period pieces don't sell. I said, what about Titanic? They said, yeah. that's different. I go, what's different? They said, that's history. I said, all right, what about Indiana Jones? Well, that's different. Why is that different? That's Spielberg. Period pieces don't sell. You know, this is the thing about Hollywood, land of bilk and money. You can't do things. There are cardinal rules. You, for, for 15 years, they were telling me you can't have movies that are female driven. Everything is a cardinal rule until mm -hmm. somebody makes it work. Yeah. And then it's gone. So Captain America, the first Avenger opens up. I called this executive. I go, what about Captain America? And I hung up the phone. <laughs> exactly. It, 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 it was, it, it, it fell through my fingers like the same. Yeah. And um, that, that was painful. It remains painful to this day. I think in, in this day and age, it could be a streaming series that could be shot partially in black and white. And I mean, I mean, there's just so many things to do. And now with back then we had no computer effects mm -hmm. and now what could be done with that great character, it, it's unbelievable. So um, that's a story of one of the big fish that got away. I gotta ask you two things real quick. I promise I'll be quick. No, it's fine. It, it's Batman stuff. Yeah. What do you think about Matt Reeves and Dylan Clark and their team creating the Batman verse where we'll get uh, the story with like the Penguin series on HBO Max? They're doing the Arkham on, on uh, series on HBO Max, and they've alluded to other things they may do. Uh, I never would have thought we would get that. And now we get this whole huge universe based on the Batman world. I think it's great. Okay, so <clears throat> buckle your seatbelt for another long answer to a short okay. question. I'm talking now as a comic book historian. That's the hat I'm going to wear now. <clears throat> the Marvel Universe was created by one editor who was also the writer. Now, this is not taking away from the um, plotting that was done by Jack Kirby, Steve Ditko, mm -hmm. Don Heck, uh, and, and the whole stable of co-creators of it. But it was one unified editor and writer. As a result, the Marvel universe had a consistent tone throughout, and it was always being aimed at the same audience. The rules were consistent throughout from book to book. The continuity was consistent. You knew if you were reading a comic book in July 1963, a Marvel comic, you knew if Thor was in New York at that time and might zip through Times Square in the middle of a Spider-Man story. You knew what was in outer space. Mm -hmm. You knew what was below the ocean. You had that consistency that can be readily translated into a Marvel cinematic universe. Now let's go to historically to DC. DC, since very early on, had as many as six to eight editors. Editorships at DC were uh, often considered fiefdoms. You had Mort Weisinger at Superman, you had Julie Schwartz at, um, at uh, Batman and the Justice League characters, and they had their own writers and their own artists that were theirs. They built walls around their characters. They built moats. They filled it with alligators. And there was very little crossover, except like in World's Finest. And that went to Mort Weisinger. And sorry, Julie, but he's going to handle it there. Mort loved to aim his comic books at 8 to 12-year-old boys. Julie was going for a much older audience and tried to do some more sophisticated graphic storytelling. Then you had Murray Boltonoff down the hall who was doing Brave and Bold with Batman and was doing Superboy and the Legion of Superheroes over there. 
aimed at different audiences, completely different tones. So you did not have a unified universe. Mm -hmm. And the most dramatic point I can make is I was about maybe 10, 11 years old. I go to my drugstore on a Wednesday and I buy two DC comics. One was either Superman or Action. The other one was, I think, a showcase Aquaman, maybe. And I read the Superman comic book. I loved it. In this comic book, Superman goes to Atlantis and falls in love with a mermaid. Because under the water, Atlantis has this big dome. And inside, all the people are mermaids and mermen. That was really, really cool when you were 10 years old. Mm -hmm. And I put it aside. I open Aquaman. Wait a minute. He's the king of Atlantis. Underwater, there's no dome. There are no mermaids. Mm -hmm. There are no mermen. Two comic books, same week, same comic book company, and no continuity. So by its very organic nature, DC tended to be universes of Metropolis, a universe of Gotham City, a universe of Paradise Island, a universe of Atlantis. And that always seemed to work best in the DC comic book world. And that then presents challenges in terms of bringing to the screen these different characters and the choices needed to be made by different filmmakers and an overall strategy included. I mean, one of the basic challenges, take, take a panel out of a Justice League movie and picture in today's world, the challenge of showing that panel projected into a movie or TV show that shows Batman with a green guy from Mars standing behind him with his arm around him with a one inch high guy sitting in a one inch floating easy chair over his other shoulder as Batman is talking to a guy who's talking to a fish. That's challenging. Mm -hmm. Not saying it can't be done or mm -hmm. hasn't been done. I'm just saying it's challenging. And, and that's why when you talk about DC universe, Marvel universe, you're really talking apples and oranges. I got in debates with folks about that because you taught me that long ago, the history of that. And so we get this this own Batman verse that's, you know, with the Batman and then sequels and then the, the HBO Max stuff. And this is what I want to ask you. At the same time, almost, got Michael Keaton is back as Batman. What's your thoughts? Would you, after Batman returns and we got Batman Forever and Keaton walked away, did you ever think that we would see Michael Keaton as Batman? in a live action film again? Think no, hope yes. Okay. Yeah. You know, I go back now, oh my God, it's a long, long time. When we had in development, there was Batman meets Superman with Wolfgang Peterson. Mm -hmm. And Batman Beyond was in development as a live yeah. action movie with a, with a really good script by Paul Dini. Um, and when Batman Beyond was being developed, I said, this is a Clint Eastwood movie. This should be Clint Eastwood in his, at that point, say age 70 something, 75, whatever it was. Clint Eastwood with a cane being Bruce Wayne mm -hmm. uh, would be an amazing movie. And unfortunately that development hell uh, wound up staying in development hell. Um, but it's amazing if you allow your mind to go crazy and think of what can be, um, it, it's, it's fascinating. Um, when it was announced that Michael Keaton would be back, I learned something incredible personally. I learned that at this age, I can still do cartwheels. <laughs> Very good. And you relish, I know that's the right word to describe it, but no issue with Robert Pattinson's Batman over here in the Batman verse, and then Keaton's Batman over here, wherever that the Keaton verse is now, that's perfectly, that's fine, right? Absolutely. absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Uh, yeah, I, I just want to go like, <laughs> you know, I, I'm excited about it, about all of this. Because that's something that we wouldn't have had not all that many years ago, I don't no, think. No, and you're even getting League of Super Pets. And, yeah. Uh, you know, you talk about clever. Um, I mean, where do you yeah. see what's coming with, with, with that stuff too? And again, a tip of the hat to the animation folks, yeah. please. 
the, uh, absolutely brilliant work since Batman the Animated Series. Uh, and, and you look over the years at what they've done. Oh, my God. Under the Red Hood, mm-hmm. uh, for, for example. Um, just one of the spectacular things. I still contend Batman Mask of the Phantasm is one of the greatest stories, Batman stories, ever told in any medium. With you, yeah. Um, yeah. J- just great, great, great stuff. Um, so let me just, a, a quick shout out to Sam Register and Bruce Tim and um, uh, Paul Dini, Alan Burnett, Eric Radomski, Andrea Romano, um, Kevin Conroy, Mark Hamill, the people that got that ball rolling. Um, man, uh, just incredible work. Ryan, anything you want to ask Mr. You before we let him go? Oh, uh, well, first commenting three bits in the book that I really like, and we don't have to go into details. I love the Peter Lorre's picture in a wallet. Uh, yeah. Um, Bloomington drive in, <laughs> <laughs> and then the three sovereigns of Sarah story uh to open up the book specifically because my my mom in the guest bedroom has one of those beds uh but i never i never heard the origins of sleep tight um so yeah that was a great to just get me hooked in it drew me in pretty fast and i've gotten to rope the bed with her and it's pretty fascinating to to then hear your you know your story about it well wait a minute you better explain to your audience when you said you roped the bed um they might have the wrong idea Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Sorry, I apologize. Okay, so the, this was pre-Box Springs. Um, so it was uh, rope that there are pegs on the wooden frame of a bed, and you have to basically line the rope, zigzag it, and then you have enough left that you come back and you zigzag it again, and that's the support system for the mattress. So I've done that. Fortunately, we have a mattress that's made from actual material and is not from hay. As you explained in the story that (laughs) back then the mattress was full of hay, which was from the barns outside. So good night, sleep tight. Don't let the bed bugs bite, which as a kid, I was always raised. Oh, it rhymes. It's just fun to say. And it's like, no, because actually kids would get bit while they slept by bugs. (laughs) And you had to tighten those pegs if you wanted to get a good night's sleep. The ropes had to be taught. And I, yeah, she, my mom was telling me, she's like, you need to pull it. She just told me to do it. And this wasn't like as a kid, this was semi-recently that I just got exposed to this. And so something historical like that is pretty great to get your hands on for the first time. But a question I've always wanted to ask you, because I'm a born and raised Hoosier. I'm in Fort Wayne, Indiana right now. Uh, did you have any influence? And if so, how much to make the Batman 89 Gotham flag, the Indiana state flag? Um, it's briefly there behind Harvey Dent in the office for a scene. Usually when I get this question, it's mm-hmm. about the Dark Knight trilogy and the fact that the Wayne Foundation logo looks exactly like the IU logo. Mm, that's, what okay. I, that's what I usually get in this one. I think you are the first person that has ever asked me about IU or Indiana connected to the first Batman movie. Um, my gut instinct is saying, preserve the mystique. Okay. Uh, for the same reason, we don't have to always say what the actual factual real origin sure. of the Joker yeah. is. Um, a lot of it could just be what was in his mind, illusions. Um, okay. And I think we'll leave it with the mystique. I like it. It was always for me. I didn't know if I was projecting because I wanted it to be, but then I would pause and dissect that. And I'm like, that's, the, that's our state flag. <laughs> I love it. I love it. Anything else you want to mention that you're up to or got coming up besides the the great book, Batman's Batman? No, it's just, um, I hope everybody enjoys the movie. Um, I think I'm telling everybody the second time you see it is maybe the best viewing. Although a lot of people online are correcting me and saying it's the third or the fourth time. It really counts. Um, But you're so typically bowled over the first time you see it. Yeah, because you've never seen anything like it. You've never seen anything like it. That the second time you can actually absorb a lot of things you missed, plot details, character details, things you see going on in the background. Um, and people are telling me just how much they pick up with a uh, with further viewings, and that's kind of cool too. Not as, not asking you to pick between Batman films, but I will say as a put, put your Batman fan ball cap on. It's on. 
What? I got it on it right is. now. Exactly. <laughs> I didn't get literally. The I'm sorry. I was, yes. <laughs> I, and I got this one on because it matches my underoos. Yes. <laughs> I like it. What was there a specific part or moment in the film that hit you and your Batman fan heart more than any other? Not not saying it's the the best part or just something that really hits you and your Bat fan. Oh my God! There's heart. just so much. Um, one of it is the sound of his boots. Mm -hmm. And only if you saw the picture, do you know what I'm talking about? Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, in the shadows. Another one is, I think it is the greatest Batmobile chase scene ever done. I'm with you. Um, number three, I could go on and on and on about um, Zoe Kravitz, about um, Catwoman. I mean, all, all of them, the, the cast is just, every single person is, is sensational uh, in, in this show. So I, 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 it would be wrong for me to single out uh, just a couple of people. Um, and then the ending, the ending, because this is a character who, this, this is someone who is evolving. Yes. And you're, you're, you're seeing in his eyes, you're hearing in his words, you're seeing in his body movements this evolution from vengeance to justice and uh, to wherever the Batman is going to evolve and to wherever Bruce Wayne is going to evolve. And that's absolutely intriguing, enticing. Um, it, it just leaves you going, I've, I, how am I going to possibly wait to see what the next step of his evolution is going to be? It, it's, it's just... Yeah, the, there the, were the ending left me with goosebumps. The Bruce's arc when it started to turn during the end made me whew, a few times. And uh, there's two different times when it involved hands being reached and hands being accepted. Mm -hmm. that make and trying to be spoiler free if that makes sense right, right, right. you know yeah i know exactly what you're talking yeah. about um and it, and it's great i i love a lot of the debate going on online now as to uh a year or two in how much of this entity is batman and how much is bruce wayne at this moment mm -hmm. and where is it going to go and where is that balance going to go uh, it, it, as things evolve. And there's a lot of debate going on about it. And it's it's a very intriguing debate. Um, and, and people have very, very different ideas about it. Mm -hmm. Very good. All right, with that, I appreciate, appreciate it very much coming on. Talking Anytime, with you Bill. Uh, yes, love you guys, love the site, and uh, wish you well. And uh, let me know how you like the seventh and eighth viewings. I uh, absolutely, absolutely will. Thanks a lot. Fast. Appreciate Thank you. It. Thanks.